It's indeed a pleasure today for me to introduce our three speakers, the first third of these uh, the sets. I threw that number in there so Freeman can uh, I'll th always throw something with math in there for Freeman's sake. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kaf Jirasa. He's an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Duke University School of Medicine. He was the first African American to complete a PhD in neurobiology at Duke University. His research interests focus on using neurotechnology to understanding how changes in the brain produce neurological and mental illness. In 2009, Dr. Girasa obtained an MD from the Duke University School of Medicine. He is a product of UMC's nationally renowned Meyerhoff Scholarship Program. And while he was doing all that, he also had the time to be a conference champion in, in the long jump, an academic All-American, and student body, student body president. Just last week, Dr. Girasa was recognized as one of UMBC's distinguished alumni in a reception held in this very same building. We are delighted that he has accepted our invitation to come back home twice this month. Dr. Girasa has served on the board of directors of the Student National Medical Association, a national organization dedicated to the eradication of health care disparities. Through his service, Koff participated in numerous programs geared towards exposing youth to science and technology and providing health education for underserved communities. Dr. Jurassic's ultimate goal is to combine his research, medical training, and community experience to improve outcomes for diverse communities suffering from neurological and psychiatric illnesses. I give you Dr. Koff Jurassic. His friends called him CJ. He was 19 years old when he started getting messages from the TV and radio telling him to kill himself and his family. Just a couple months earlier, he graduated valedictorian of his class. He went off to college full of the hopes that he could change the world. But soon after arriving, he started having problems concentrating. He failed his first semester of classes and his parents, knowing that there's something wrong with their brilliant son, took him to see a pediatrician, then a neurologist, then a psychiatrist. No answers. The only thing that they did know was that CJ was in no condition to go back to school. So they kept him home that next semester. One day when they were all sitting at the kitchen table, CJ got up, walked up to his bedroom on the second story, opened the window, and jumped. His parents were still sitting at the table when they heard the crash outside in the bushes. CJ survived without major injuries, but his parents, absolutely terrified to leave him by himself, took 12-hour shifts watching him. After a week and a half, they were exhausted, and CJ wasn't getting any better. He was now seeing angels and demons. The pictures on his wall screamed at him all day long. They told him that he was worthless, that he deserved to die. His parents were out of options. They didn't know what else to do. And so they decided to take him to an emergency room. As they, as they were driving over in the car, CJ reached over, opened the back door, and tried to jump out. It was his second suicide attempt in, in, in a week and a half. His mom just happened to be sitting next to him, and she was able to pull the, door, the car door closed. It was the longest drive of their life. Finally, they made it to the emergency room, and after sitting there for, for two days, they were admitted to my inpatient psychiatric unit. When, when I met CJ, he'd have long conversations with the walls, each one ending the same way, with him begging for them to let him live. I, I, I'd seen these set of symptoms before. And so I started CJ on an antipsychotic. And over the course of several weeks, CJ went from being critically ill to being severely ill. His parents were at a loss. Why, why wasn't CJ any better? CJ had schizophrenia. So I, I, I studied my, myself. As a psychiatrist, you can, you can never predict how a family is going to respond to getting this, this sort of news. Some treat it like a death sentence. Others respond with confusion. But CJ's parents responded in a way that I'd never encountered. A, a, as soon as the words schizophrenia left my mouth, his parents froze. I, 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 I tried to, to walk him through it and, 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 and explain the, 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 the diagnosis and, and the prognosis. And, and CJ's parents looked at me and, and his dad, it, with, with an almost an act of defiance, looked at me and said, pick another diagnosis. Maybe 
bipolar disorder, maybe early outs had Alzheimer's. I kept trying to explain schizophrenia to them and the, and the symptoms and, 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 and finally his mom paused and looked at me and said, Dr. D, you just don't understand. If you diagnose CJ with that illness, you don't understand the stigma he'll have to deal with. You don't understand the shame, you will ruin his life. But I did understand the stigma and the shame. My family has struggled with mental illness for generations. Out of one of my parents' siblings, three out of four of them carries a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression. I, I, I remember what it was like to commit a family member when I was in graduate school. And I remember what it was like when another one went missing, only for us to find them in an alleyway hallucinating six months later. I understand the shame, it's so palpable in my family that every time I give a talk, they ask for me never to identify them by name. I understand the shame because I spent most of my 20s absolutely terrified that any given day I could wake up hallucinating or that I could hear voices. And, and finally, when I passed that critical window and turned 30, that critical window for developing a psychiatric illness, that fear became replaced with the fear that one day one of my children or my nieces or my nephews would be counted amongst the 20 to 30 percent of Americans diagnosed with a mental illness annually. So you see, it's not curiosity that leads me to study the organ that's most linked to mental illness. It's fear. The brain is made up of over 200 billion cells. Those cells and who we are are, are, are interactions with each other. The, the, the nature of, of love and curiosity is locked within the organ that's the size of a, a piece of hair. For, for centuries, philosophers and, and scientists have tried to understand how this organ works. We've made a lot of progress. We now understand that there are differences between your left brain and your right brain when it comes to things like movement and speech and curiosity. But it turns out there was, there was something that those early scientists and, and, and philosophers didn't understand about the brain, it, that there was, this, there was this organizing principle that they couldn't see or touch, electricity. Electricity is defined as a movement of charge. And, 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 and what is remarkable is that if, it, it turns out if you think about one of the most debilitating mental disorders there are, this is the most debilitating disorder in the world, depression, the best treatment for depression is actually putting electricity directly into the brain. Now, you, you, you might be surprised to hear that this treatment classically thought of of electroconvulsive therapy or shock therapy is still used at medical centers all throughout the country. So this brings me to the question I'd like to pose today. What if mental disorders are disorders of electricity? Electricity is defined as a movement of charge in the brain. Charge is made up of chemicals. Those chemicals are sodium, potassium, chloride ions, and calcium. Just under half of those cells are able to move the charges back and forth across their surface to generate electrical pulses. So you see in the brain, chemicals is directly related to the electrical communication between brain cells. For the last few decades, psychiatrists have focused on these chemicals. It's why you hear about things like chemical imbalances. But for neuroscientists, the holy grail is understanding how those billions of electrical pulses organize themselves to generate thoughts and feelings and emotions and movement. In principle, if we can understand how this process happens in a normal setting, we can then figure out how this process becomes dysfunctional in the case of mental illness. Now, if, for example, let's say you wanted to understand an electrical system like a computer you might take it apart, right? When, when you're young, we, we, we call it breaking things. <laughs> when you're a little older, we have really cool terms for this. It's called reverse engineering. But the principle is the same. But by studying each of the individual pieces, we can figure out how they work together. Now, as, as, as hopefully logic would dictate, um, before you started taking the computer apart, you would unplug it. And you might really understand how the motherboard was organized and structured and the hard drive, but you actually wouldn't understand how a, a construct like the internet worked because the, the computer would have to be plugged in and functioning to understand how it's working. Classically, we've studied the brain with the power off. When we began to study the brain with the power on, we realized that there were little brain waves, almost, almost like these, these rhythms that you could observe in the brain. And these rhythms work together in the same way that a, a conductor can allow all the instruments in a symphony orchestra to work together to produce music. These little rhythms were working together to allow brain cells to coordinate, to, to produce emotions and thoughts and feelings. So that brings me to the, 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 the question that I'd really like to pose today. I'm a scientist, yes. I, I'm a psychiatrist, yes. But I'm also an engineer, actually trained here at UMBC. And what if these mental illnesses are actually not only a problem of electricity, but a problem in this brain metronomic system? You, you can see here how this metronomic system could work. 
So on the left, you see the brain wave, and every time the brain wave hits the top, we have the cells in the green fire, and every time the brain wave hits the bottom, you have the cells in the red fire. And you could see that the green cells and the red cells are coordinated together because of this brain wave. Now, it, it turns on, as scientists began to study this process, they found that this process exists in the human brain, it exists in animals, it exists in mice and other rodents, and you can also find that when you take uh, animal models of disease, that this process becomes dysfunctional. So then the question is simple. If psychiatric illness is, a, is due to a disorder in the brain metronomic system, then our job as a brain engineer is pretty simple. The question becomes, can we find where these brain metronomes are broken in the case of illness, and can we fix them? In my lab, we accomplish this by implanting electrodes, each the size of a piece of hair, into the brains of animals. And then we're able to record electrical activity all throughout the brain as the animals are going through various behavioral tasks. We can then change genes in the animals to give them genes that give risk for mental illness, or we can expose them to stress or drugs of abuse. And then we use a tool called machine learning to understand the patterns in which electricity is organized in the animal's brain. Finally, we've developed stimulators that once we find where the pattern is dysfunctional, we can correct the electrical rhythms in the animal's brain and restore normal behavior. Now, I can imagine what you're thinking. CJ isn't a mouse, and neither is my loved one. The mouse doesn't hallucinate, it doesn't get guilty, it doesn't feel sad. But I don't think that's the point at all. I think that in the same way that we can use a mouse's heart to understand cardiac rhythm so we can develop new treatments like calcium channel blockers and pacemakers, we can use brain rhythms to generate new treatments that might one day be helpful for people like CJ. So, CJ, CJ managed to pull through. He was fortunate in several ways. He, he had a loving family, he responded well to treatment, and he got really good psychiatric care early on. But for far too many people in this country, the best treatments we have available just aren't good enough. We need cures for psychiatric disorders. But what if we thought about this all wrong? What if psychiatric disorders are due to dysfunctional, dysfunctional electrical processing in, 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 in the brain? Well, in, in the future that I see, scientific progress will have eliminated stigma, and progress would have gotten rid of shame. In, in the future that I see, our, our, our brothers or our sisters, our parents, our nieces, and our nephews would have lived out their life's greatest dreams, because in the future that I see, we won't simply treat psychiatric disorders by tuning electricity. We will cure them. Thank you.